We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Does this quote sound familiar to you? I mean, you're going to say yes because it was just read. So. <laughs> but does it sound familiar to you? Have, have we heard this before? In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus says the following to his disciples. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Following that, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command. So let me ask you this. Well, first off, before I even ask you this, it's important to note that the Gospel of John is the same, comes from the same community that wrote the letters of John. That's not to say that John wrote those, because John never claims that. The person in the Gospel claims to be the beloved disciple, whoever that may be. Um, but since we are, uh, since it's gotten the name John, we'll just call him John for ease and for, for our sakes. But the author of John here. Is, is telling us that Jesus said that there is no greater love than for one who, than the love of one who lays down his life for his friends. And that all who are Jesus' friends will do what Jesus commands. Now, in, in terms of friendship, I wish it was that way, right? Like, if you're really my friend, you'll just do everything I tell you to do, right? No, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, the fact the fact of the matter is, Jesus is saying that anyone who claims to be close to Jesus, anyone who claims to be a friend of Jesus, they're going to do what what Jesus commanded them to do. So let me ask you this: What did Jesus command? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. What else? Love God above all other things, to which he put the stipulation that in order to do that, you must love your neighbor as yourself. So those two go hand in hand, for sure. What else did Jesus tell us to do? What, what else did Jesus command us to do? Well, in the scripture you read, it said to lay down your life, just as he laid down his life for us. To lay down your life, absolutely. Boy, we like to pass that one over. You know, like, love our neighbors ourselves. We can try that. You know, we'll fail, but we'll try it. To love God? Oh, sure, yeah, we love God. Lay down my life. What are you kidding? No. I don't love my friend that much. I don't love my neighbor that much. I certainly don't love my enemies that much. What is this lay down your life stuff? Jesus commanded in the Gospel of John uh, that we will love one another as he loved us. And indeed, that entails laying down your life, because that is what Jesus did. He loved us that much, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And of course, we go on in that Gospel of John to know that that, that, that kind of love brings Jesus to the cross. Jesus laid down his life because he loved. And if, if Jesus did that, then certainly he's calling us to do that as well. But back to the first letter of John. The author says that we know love by this very fact that Jesus laid down his life for us. That is love. And that very act has shown us what true love is. That very act has shown us that true love is all-encompassing. It is self-sacrificing. It is all-giving. It is selfless, compassionate, and absolutely, totally costly. Oh, and by the way, it transforms and it consumes. Maybe it consumes and then it transforms. I guess it just depends, right? 
But those things are what come out of true love. As such, the author tells us that the crux of the matter of love is that we ought to, just like Jesus did, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Now, before we go further, let me ask, how often can you say that you have seen that kind of love, that kind of devotion in, in the church? Now, I'm not saying this church particularly by itself, but the church as a whole, this church included, obviously, because we're a part of the church. But how often have you seen that kind of self-sacrificing love in the church? I mean, sure, we've seen people sacrificing their time, their talents, and their presence to this or to that ministry in the church. Sure, we've seen people give up some money to help others. That, 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 that happens. And sure, we, we have seen and even been a part of those things, myself included. But can we say that we have laid down our lives for one another? Have we given that much? Would we be willing to give that much? In essence, we are to love each other with the same kind of love that a parent has for his or her child. When I think of self-sacrificing, all-giving love, when I think of self-sacrificing, selfless, never-ending, abiding love, I think of a parent and a child. I think of a parent who would lay down their life so that their child may live. But let me ask you this. Have we seen that displayed as much as we would like to in the church? It's easy for us to see, to envision that kind of love within a child, or within a parent and a child. But is it easy for us to see that kind of love in the church? The kind of love that calls us to sacrifice everything at any cost for each other. Now the author goes on further than just this, because the author always goes on further than just this. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Let me, let me ask that again, because this is what the, the author uh, in, in the Gospel of John is asking us. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. What the author is saying is that if you have the good deeds and the resources to help others, and yet you refuse to help others, God's love does not, does not abide in you. These are challenging words, my friend. Because what John is saying is it's all or it's nothing. It's all or it's nothing. There is no sitting on the fence and saying, well, I've got my toes in the water today, but it's a little cold, so I ain't jumping in. <laughs> right? right? It's you're either in or you're out. You're either with Christ or against Christ. You're either abiding in Christ's love or you are a part from Christ's. Love. If you have the goods and the resources to help others, and you refuse to help others, God's love does not abide in you. And that love has to start here among our own. If we could care less about caring for our own brothers and sisters in Christ, what business 
do we have caring for anybody else? You know this to be true. A parent that can't care for their own child has no business feeding the children in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood next to them. You take care of your own first, and then you'll have the resources and the energy and the ability to take care of others. But you can't do it in opposite order. You can't let your own children starve so that other children can eat. Right? That, that makes sense. So if we can't in the church model this abiding love of God, if we can't in this church connect with one another and love each other and support each other and take care of each other, then we have no business being a church in the world. That's not to say that we are, are better than anyone else, or more deserving, or more important. This isn't one of those things with, well, we've got suffering people in America, so we shouldn't worry about the suffering in Africa, or in, in Asia. It's not that kind of superiority thing coming out, but that we are modeling it here. And out of that modeling it here, it extends out into the world. It's not about whether we're suffering more or less, but that we will not allow for suffering in our midst because we care and we love, and God's love dwells within us. And out of that love, we will then go out into the world and not stand for suffering there either. But it has to start here. So let me ask this. Does God's love abide in you? Do you abide in God's love? I'm not asking for you to answer this right here, right now, but to reflect upon it. Because if we cannot show God's abiding love toward those we claim to love, we'll in reality never be able to show it in the world. So again, reflect upon it. Does God's love abide in you? And do you abide in God's love? Are we perfected here in God's abiding love? Or do we have room to grow? Does God's love abide here in Harmony Hill? Does it abide in Stillwater? Does it abide in Sussex County? Or do we have room to grow? And if we are honest, and I know each of us here is honest. If we are honest, then we, we, we have to admit that we all have room to grow, myself included. This message is just as important for me as it is for anybody else. We all have room to grow, both individually, but also as a church community. So let us open ourselves to God's abiding love. The kind of love that sacrifices all for each other. Let us be transformed by it. So that through us, God's love may begin to abide in and transform our little community. As well as the world outside of it. <coughs> Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for... For what you are doing here and now in this community. Lord, you've called us to abide in your love, to be a people of love. You've called us to live out your love, both here and beyond. But it has to start here. Build your love within us so that we may continue to grow now and in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.